When I first read this quote, I thought to myself, wow, Karl Marx has really nailed it and he's on to something of great consequence. And so when I was putting this talk together, I thought I would build my narrative around sort of a micro version of this, a very personal version of technology creating history, as well as a macro version, uh, sort of a broader generic view of, of technology creating history, and then feather in some past, present, and future uh, aspects of technology, and then leave you uh, with a conundrum of sorts uh, to ponder conceivably after we leave this August Kirby Theater. Four years ago today, I was invited to uh, uh, meet with a founder of a technology company in Los Angeles. So I flew to LAX, I get in a cab, I get to their building, and uh, just for the visual, the building is in the shadow of that massive Hollywood uh, sign in the Hollywood Hills. Right up on the elevator, I'm met by the founder, and he gives me something that would have to be described as a delicious tour. He introduces me to everybody in the company, all the different departments. And at one point, as we're sort of circling the area, he said, would you mind dropping into this office? And I said, not at all. I go in, and I realize it wasn't really an office at all. It was a lab. There were all forms of deconstructed computers everywhere, sensors and chips and, and motherboards and all of it. And of course, the requisite uh, Star Wars characters duct taped to the wall everywhere and sort of floating in the air, which is the purest signal of a tech company, for sure. Um, and so after we're in, he said, would you mind putting on this headset? And it looks something like this one, other than the the eye tab, in this case, it was a, a tab that went directly to the middle of my eyebrows and touched my forehead very lightly. After I had this assemblage on, he said, do you see that lamp across the way? And it was about from me to the third or fourth row here. I said, of course. And he said, look at it and think of the word on, which I did. And then I turned the light on with my mind. And then I turned it off. And then I turned it on and off and on and off. And it was the most remarkable moment for me. And it documented Karl Marx's theory of um, technology making history in a very, very personal way. It changed my life in many ways, and all of us have had a comparable experience in some sense with technology, that moment, either when you're younger or at any point in your life where you think, wow, it's something. Now to the more macro version or the generic version of um, of what technology can do is, uh, this is a, a, a video from a friend of mine, David Lorenzini, who we all in some sense owe a debt of gratitude to because in the year 2000, he invented something called Keyhole, which Google bought and ultimately became Google Earth, which we were all very familiar with and used sort of in some regular basis. And this is his view of uh, the year 2020, so four years from now, and it has some great imaging, imaging that I think you might appreciate, and it sets the stage for the rest of the talk.
are many historic flexion, uh, inflections that, have, that document that technology uh, creates history, specifically these obvious cases where industrial revolution, oil production, transportation, steel, the computer itself. And my view of, of these events historically are the technological developments forge cataclysms that make a mark. And here's history on a parallel taking note. To the more modern view of this progression, um, the internet itself certainly, social media in many ways uh, certainly feeds into it. AR, VR, IoT, IOE, Web 3.0, which we saw in part in the video, and artificial intelligence. For those of you who may not sort of know these acronyms, augmented reality is AR, VR is virtual reality, mixed reality, internet of things, internet of everything, that kind of stuff. And each one of these platforms feeds one another, lending itself to a progression. Uh, in my personal world uh, these days, I'm uh, involved heavily with AR and VR in particular. Augmented reality is a technology that allows for the superimposition of computer graphics on the real world. What does that mean? That means you can superimpose information on virtually any subject matter. The Great Wall of China, the Eiffel Tower, any individual in this room, even Williams College. Which lends itself to the, uh, the other forms of, of virtual reality, which is a completely immersive technology, and, and mixed reality, which um, Microsoft is developing a product that should be available early next year called HoloLens, where we will be able to have a hologram of, of me being here giving this talk without being here. Um, so technology is at this stage where it's about to accelerate very aggressively. The best illustration of this is not so much even IOE or IoT, but AI, artificial intelligence. And the pitchfork I have listed up here or citing is just to suggest some of the core developments. There are massive companies as well as individuals in their garage that are working towards the ends of these pitchfork comments, which are or, or places like robotics and machine learning and natural language processing, all of which contribute to this sort of thing. And the most powerful thing that I know of or I can conceive of as it relates to AI right now is that mankind person kind, cannot think beyond AI at this point. Bill Gates this year said, um, we're going to have to, there's a moment in time in not too distant future, we're going to have, have to ask AI how smart it is, because we won't be able to know ourselves. The last thought about this slide is there is a fellow who is a TED talker, his name is Tim Urban. He's invented a concept that I find very compelling. And he said, he's, the acronym that he's come up with is a DDU. Some of you may know of it, it's a drop dead unit. And how he profiles this is you have to, if you start with Neanderthal man, you have to go to 1750 for DDU one, so 200,000 years, give or take. And that means if you take a Neanderthal, you put him in 1750, overwhelmed by everything that he sees and knows, drops dead on the spot. 1750 to 1950, so 200,000 to then. 200 years, same scenario. Put somebody from 1750, 1950, drops dead on the spot. The next DDU, DDU3, will be 1950 to 2040. So I'll drop dead in 2040 for sure. Um, but it's a very compelling notion when you think of sort of the acceleration of technology and what it can mean and sort of this compression of time as it relates to all of it. So then I got to a point is in thinking about this talk, why? Why is all this going on? Why, does it, you know, why do we do this? And it's somewhat clear to me that there is this sociological ego that mankind has globally and worldwide in sort of every fashion, where technology is merely a reflective tool. It's a way for us to look at ourselves and provide information and identify ourselves in some consequential way. There is a chicken and egg scenario about this in my mind as well, which means, and it relates back to Carl and his thinking, because isn't it true that technology doesn't, does not create history, but mankind creates technology that ultimately creates history? Um, and we get to a point in that that there are human beings sort of producing product that lends itself to something of great consequence. And here's the rub, or here's the way the final piece of the story unfolds in my mind. It's what happens when human beings are no longer the top species on the planet. What does that mean when we become subjugated to a technology, for example? How do we feel? What do we do when 
technology is devising itself for itself, and ultimately getting to a point where Carl may, be, may have been massively correct, where technology will be creating history for itself. I have a final piece of reassurance in some sense, because there's a dark side to that story. And that is to say, the good news is the future won't happen until the present is ready for it. Um, and human beings are pretty obstinate in a way. We're going to hold on to our grip of control of the planet and consequential role therein until we're ready to let go. And that will transition over time. So with that thought in mind, I've put together a small ode that I'll read to you if you don't mind. Our stewardship of the planet and ultimately our storytelling to future generations must include a coexistence philosophy and importantly, safeguards with technology to ensure our fate and the fate of human history moving forward. Thank you. <laughs>